You all, I'm not going to pay a very long introduction at all, but um, I want to say a few things about a very, very dear friend. Um, someone who, uh, quite honestly, inspires me every single time I see his drawings, the drawings of his studio, the drawings and models of his unit. Um, it's, uh, it's a great, great pleasure to be able to introduce CJ this evening. His latest book, which is just, CJ, I was saying to someone on the train today, it's a bit like Woody Allen, um, in that you get a book each year, like with Woody Allen, you get a film each year. Um, CJ is that productive. He's also that exacting. CJ and I were just talking about, there's a note in the front of this book that his studio designed it. So working within a template, um, it is really CJ and his office's production. Um, an extraordinary set of drawings um, and ideas around two themes that are very, very close and dear to my heart. A couple of years ago, he produced a book uh, about food. What was it called again, CJ? It was Food City. Food City. Uh, one subject very, very dear to my heart. This one uh, focused quite a lot around climate change, which is increasingly a subject of interest to me as I work in Norway. And the people in Norway talk about it almost apoc apocalyptically in the way that it's changing the landscape and actually the infrastructure of architecture there. So two themes, we kind of slightly run in parallel that way, CJ. Um, I've known CJ for some time. He's an extraordinarily exacting individual. Uh, the precision of the drawings, the precision of the text, are testament to both a precision and exactness, but also, you all, an extraordinary imagination. Um, an imagination, ah, I just think almost second to none. There's nothing honestly more pleasurable for me than to open another book of his and also know that the words are gonna be equivalent to the images, CJ. And that's one thing that as an architect, uh, wow, do we have difficulty writing. Uh, perhaps there's a reason for that, but one thing that CJ also covers is the text. So not only are you mesmerized by the drawings, but you are equally mesmerized by the text in the book. He covers extraordinary ground. I have no idea how far he's going to go through it, but nevertheless, there will be much more that he isn't able to cover that still exists in this book after this evening. Um, that's all I want to say, CJ. I really want to bring you forward. So everyone, please welcome CJ Lim. First, I'd like to acknowledge the team that work on the projects, the case study, the research, and some of the photographs and so forth. They are a very important part of my world, my discourse, and um, they basically, they are the, the, the people that really made the most contribution to most of my research. Um, this book tonight is the third of the quartet. The first was Smart Cities and Eco Warrior. It was um, a book that looked into how urban agriculture and nature would augment the city. Most of the projects in that book uh, were commissions from the Chinese and the Korean government, where we look into how um, food production, urban agriculture, uh, and nature could be very much part of the human community, not humans and then the countryside. Uh, but it could be much more hybridized. The second book, Food City, was looking into food security and food cultures in city. Um, within the book, there was a project, a case study called the Food Parliament, where we started to speculate what governance would produce, what sort of tectonic would produce in relationship to food security. So, back to tonight. This is, as I said, the third of the quartet. Um, we look into climate change. These are the images we are bombarded with constantly, uh, either in text or, or in journals, in newspaper, on the news, on the internet, on YouTube. And we are very familiar with it, and we seem rather sort of um, hopeless in trying to combat it when you get um, the leader of the free world um, not believing in climate change. Um, by the way, I'm, I hope I'm not going to offend any nationality tonight because I probably will because I will be criticizing different nationalities in their stance of climate change and, and so forth. Um, so this is, these are the problems. Overpopulation, 
um, to shortage of housing. These are some of the things that we need to address in some way. I don't have the solution for it. I'm not bringing you any solution tonight. What I do and what my research team do, what my teaching does, is that we just speculate. And I think that's a really, really important part. And so tonight, I'm showing you how we speculate and what our speculation outcomes are. This is a picture of Maldives, um, the islands. And as soon as the ocean sneezes, these islands will go underwater, I can assure you, because they're the lowest land in the entire world. And as I said, climate change is a reality and poses serious threats to infrastructure, quality of life, and entire urban systems. Not only poor countries, but rich ones will be affected. And that's really, really important to know. Um, the research tonight very much focuses on the threat and the fundamental human requirements to protect, to provide, and to participate. The stimulus for the research um, derives from postulated scenarios and processes gleaned from science fiction, literature fiction, and as well as futur futurology as from the body of scientific knowledge regarding changing environments impact on cities. <coughs> and what we want to do is to look at it from a different perspective, from learning from how science fiction writers have addressed some of these issues, rather than, you know, taking on, I'm the architect, I'm the planner, I'm the environmental engineer, how do I solve these problems? A quote from one of my favorite authors, J.G. Ballard, everything is becoming science fiction. From the margins of an almost invisible literature has sprung the intact reality of the 20th century. What the writers of modern science fiction invent today, you and I will do tomorrow. The future is a better key to the present than the past. If we were to interrogate the world of the built environment through the ingredients of speculative fiction, how would the future city take form? I'm always curious about that. And I think that's a very important question for all of us in this room, I guess, and all, everybody in the profession of the built environment. <coughs> um, rather than just following what is the, inverted brackets, correct way of doing things. I'd like to think that us architects are like alchemists we create different concoctions. Sometimes the concoction works, and it, there's magic, and sometimes it goes terribly, terribly wrong. And, you know, I can assure you, I've done more bum projects than I've had hot dinners. So the things that, you know, if you do a bad project for one term, don't worry about it. It's not the end of the world. So here, tonight, I'm going to show you my recipe of how you create an urban vision through fiction. First, Two equal portions of Brave New World and Animal Farm to accommodate the themes of equality, freedom, utopia, the perfect world, and the role of politics. Add the energy source and the building material extracted from in watermelon sugar. This is, a spread, this is spread neatly across the pre-prepared ground surface, a great expanse of salt water, the pool of tears from Alice. Carefully add the city and the city, if applied correctly, this has the effect of separating the mixture. There should be two distinct territories, one of light and the other of shadow. Next, the collection of tangible and intangible infrastructures from invisible cities should permeate the porous urban mix. A generous sprinkling of house-moving castle provides the means for the inhabitants to migrate. Finally, we animate the mixture within time and with the understanding that currencies from existing corrupt economies would be useless. Here, time itself becomes currency. Slowness and old age are celebrated as community and leisure activities. So this concoction will also <coughs> sort of the seed ingredients for some of the, the, the case study that you'll see. But what we did was that we produced this urban vision and this vision was actually drawn in a shop window in Melbourne a few years ago. Um, I think the character of infrastructure quite simply defines the, the nature of the city. And the thing is that, you know, here, this is an aerial view of London I'm sure all of you are familiar with. You know, you can easily spot at least six to eight uh, what we call traditionally infrastructure. 
Tonight, I think you know you should have an open mind about what infrastructure is and what multi-use infrastructure should be. And there, we also wanted to blur the boundary between architecture and infrastructure. Traditional infrastructure would be bridges, things engineers would do, roads, uh, and, and so forth. And they're usually single use. Here, within the book, we explored how multi-use infrastructure would be much more akin to how we create spatial po poetics, architecture. Infrastructure exists in many forms and guises. Here, it augments the city, like Central Park. Infrastructure of in, in Tiananmen Square here, it's an infrastructure of equality and also controversy at the same time. Talking of controversy or buildings, infrastructure that are at odds, if you go to the center of Istanbul, you will see the Sophia, uh, Hagia Sophia and the Blue Mosque facing each other. These two are wonderful pieces of infrastructure or, or architecture of religion. They are of epic proportions, just like the city itself. I think my favorite one will be this one in Gibraltar, where two pieces of infrastructure collide. I don't, I think, I don't think I should use the word collide. They meet at, at in, an interjunction, in, in a junction, where the highway would stop all its traffic to allow the aeroplane to either take off or, or land. And the effects of it is absolutely, it runs through the vein of the whole city then. Because if the traffic stops for the plane to take off or land, the traffic around the whole city will stop and it will be affected. So every inhabitant on there will somehow feel and get emotionally engaged in the aeroplane taking off or land. There are three chapters, obviously. Um, to I will start with to protect. From Beijing to Berlin, in our 7,000-year love affair with cities, walls have at different times and different places imprisoned people and set them free. And so the first thing that one would... The first architectonic element that comes to mind of any of us when it comes to protect would be to build a wall, to build a fence. And again, making reference to that man who wants to build this wall, um, you know, I think building a wall could sometimes be counterproductive. It would not be the right thing to do. Um, like on the East Bank here, the image here is a piece of artwork by Banksy. Um, you have to forgive his language there on, on, on the graffiti. Sometimes walls are built to protect the entire community. Here in Palna Nova, um, in this Italian city just outside of Venice, um, this, the wall was to confine uh, or to protect initially the, you know, a pretty wealthy community there. But nobody wanted to live there. So what happened was that the Venetian resorted to pardoning criminals and offering them financial incentive to settle in this idealistic Renaissance infrastructure. So for example, if you have a sentence of 10 years, they will reduce it to five years and they give you, you know, I don't know how many thousand euros if you're just willing to stay there. But still, people do not want to live there. It looks great area, on an aerial photograph, but you know, that's, that's about it. And walls also protect entire countries. Um, you know, the Great Wall of China here, I'm sure many of you are familiar with. But the idea of protection doesn't have to be confined to a wall to sort of, to sort of isolate yourself, yeah? I think, you know, the Ganges River, for example, protects, and it protects over half a billion inhabitants along its length. And I think it's a wonderful infrastructure. Um, for all its environmental wonders and also health problems that comes with it. People wash, they take water from there, they, you know, they actually pour all the kind of human nutrients into it as well, as well as sometimes dead animals, but they also then scatter ashes of cremated bodies into it. Um, but the thing is that this is an infrastructure of faith. The faithful believe that a dip in this infrastructure will cleanse a lifetime of sins and help bring salvation. That's what many of them believe. We build infrastructure to protect the souls, the faith, and the dead here. And here in Venice, um, the cemetery, 
um, is one of great, beautiful example of that kind. Or the City of Angels in Buenos Aires. Here, this talking about protecting souls and dead bodies and the dead. I guess the ultimate infrastructure to protect the dead would be the pyramids. Um, you know, the kings would be buried in there with their belongings and wealth, along with a few live uh, slaves. But I like the, the proportion, uh, the scale of this sort of um, the pyramids against the modern city. We built infrastructure to protect in all forms. Um, we, and at most times, they have rather unpleasant dystopic effects. From the Truman Show, the artificial bubble uh, that Truman lived in, to the vertical city in high rise. The first high rise would be probably be this, the lighthouse by Alexander the Great. Later on, filmmakers would create other visions, or even the great artist architect Hugh Ferris would just create this vertical vision just through light and shade. Two things only, light and shade, simple as that. And I think this is one of the most wonderful, wonderful drawings of all times, absolutely stunning. The Japanese metabolism movement attempted that. This is a project by the great architect Arata Ozaki, where him and his contemporaries even attempted to reach the heavens. For me, the most romantic sort of vertical construction would be these wonderful needles in the landscape of, in Italy, in Tuscany. It's in San Gimigiano, and they are very, very slender. They're absolutely wonderful against the, you know, the, the fantastic um, hills of the, of, the, of the Italian landscape. They were constructed by wealthy merchants to protect themselves, the family, and um, from robbers. And they think that they would have enough supply within the towers for any duration when they were held hostage in there. I would say one thing, if you uh, have the good fortune of turning out, uh, you must be, you mustn't have sort of panic attacks on vertigo and things like that. Because when I went there, the handrails were, doesn't comply with health and safety. It was just a bit of rail there. And when I looked down, I shit myself. <laughs> Not quite literally, but... <laughs> I think, you know, delineations, walls, we built walls to protect ourselves. But a lot of times, delineation could be defined in other ways too. You know, the Vatican City, which is a micronation, um, has its own rules, doesn't answer to Rome or Italy or the EU or anybody else. You know, it's, it has its own stone walls, but the real de territorial de delineation is you would find a white line in St. Peter's Square if you would turn up there. I think, you know, micronations are really unique, like the Vatican City. Um, have anybody seen The Prisoner before, the TV series? My God, I feel my age suddenly. I think this was, uh, I, I saw it when I first came to this country in, in, in the very, very, you know, late 70s, early 80s. So things that you must go and look at The Prisoner. The Prisoner is where it itself is, is it's a place, it's its country, it's, a, it's its own city, it's its own, the organization almost, and everybody within this organization is known by number. Um, this is when I start to describe micronations as dystopic entities. Similarly, Alcatraz in the Bay of San Francisco, or Principality of Sealand, or the, the image on your right hand side would be the island, the Danish island of Ilio. These ladies, they look quite severe, don't they? They look quite scary. And the thing is that they are the guardian of this piece of land, which is about 15,000 uh, square meters only. Uh, they have, the sovereignty has its own rules. As an island, they forbid anybody on that rule, the membership to read Robinson Crusoe. Um, and also, they, they are very stubborn. They, their time is 12 minutes. 12 minutes, not 10 minutes, not 5 minutes, 12 minutes behind Danish mainland time. I'm going to show you the first of a few case studies here. Um, this one is called London is flooding, question mark. <coughs> London is anticipated to flood, that's for sure. The Thames barrier will no longer be able to do its job. There's a plan to do a second barrier uh, in the Thames. Um, but 
What we were just wondering is that what will really happen if we allow London to flood? That was the kind of the what if. You will, be, you, you will find that I will be using this quote, what if, throughout the whole you know, next 40, 50 minutes. What if London were to be allowed to flood? We were inspired by the drowned world, by Ballard. So here, without the reptiles, the lagoon and the creek of office blocks half submerged would have had strange dreamlike beauty. But the iguanas brought the fantasy down to earth as their seats in the one-time boardroom indicated the reptiles have taken over the city. So this idea, if London were to allow to flood, nature would come back. So this paranoid city, in our terms, is, when we were thinking about it, was one-third an homage to Ballard, one-third speculation into the threat of nature and, the resilience, and its resilience, and one-third a provocation exercise in the notion of disaster. So there are only three hubs that we will protect. Don't worry, you, you'll be protected here at Bedford Square. So we'll protect Queen and Country, the city, the Bank of England, and Bloomsbury. So, uh, sorry, I, didn't use, I should have used the AA image there, but the things I use, UCL. So I have to show my loyalty somehow. <laughs> so here, uh, I'm going to use this scroll here. And you can see this is Queen and Country. So Buckingham Palace and the Parliament is protected. Bloomsbury is protected here, and the city of London. And the walls are built from digging up all the royal parks. So you can see these ginormous craters where the soil is then dug up to create this vertical defensive infrastructure. And the idea came from the Tower of Babel, when, when humans want to create this vertical structure to reach the heavens, to engage with God. And, but I think that the reality was that I'm, I'm absolutely fascinated. This is one of my favorite architectural images of t these architecture in Timbuktu, where the community constantly have to repair the wall, uh, these mud walls. So I could imagine, you know, me and my, my crowd from the Bartlett and you here from the AA would all be participating in this exercise, where you will be piling on soil to hide yourself behind these walls, just in case the floods were to come, just in case. So here, the thing is that it's also, the project is also critique in how paranoid we are and how dramatic we are in, in many cases, and yet we are still not taking climate change very seriously. So here is one of the hubs, uh, the built wall, and the walls will become inhabitable. All the inhabitants of London will actually pile into this, into these sort of <coughs> battery chicken coops, I would call them, and, 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 and then leave the rest of the city. And when the le so these are the infrastructure that would protect these hubs. And they're constant warning, just like any dystopic condition environment, they will be constantly warning you that, you know, the flood might come tomorrow, the next day, it's rising. And when you leave, the, hum the humans were to leave the city, then nature would come back, just like in Ballard's drown world. And then we might even end up having, to sh you know, it's a forest that we can actually shoot for our food. I think. What I'm trying to say here is that this is the project not to do. Yeah? We should not build walls, we should not, be, we should not react in such a knee-jerk reaction. We should not build these things that protect only the, the select few. And I think, you know, I think we purposely did the project almost as a critique um, of the way that we have been programmed to think of how to protect oneself or how to protect community or how to build defense systems and rather than work with climate change. And so the things that, you know, I'm more interested in how we can actually embrace climate change as in a resource, as an ingredient, um, rather than to actually be very aggressive towards it. I think we should all change our mindset that maybe sea level rise is not such a bad thing after all. The aggressive sun, sunshine, the heat island effects is not so bad. And, and pollution, can we make something out of that too? So, anyway, on to the next case study, Swine Under Sheltering Sky. Every, I think for, for me, um, the, every generation would have their superheroes. And mine was sort of created by Stan Lee, Spider-Man. I think, you know, 
in Gotham City, we have Batman. We have Spider-Man through Queens. Fantastic Four located in Midtown Manhattan. And even the Green Lantern exists in what they call Coast City, which is basically Los Angeles. And I think, you know, Stan Lee said something really interesting here in one of his uh, comics for the United Nations. He said, we need to create a new generation of global leaders, thinkers, and doers to tackle the world's most pressing issues like climate change and inequality. So th as I said earlier on, we need to change our mindset. And I think, you know, if we can't change our mindset now, maybe the younger generation could, could, could start thinking in an alternative way. And so here, there's a project that actually engages with um, two things of, in, in Denmark. One is Greenland is actually melting away because of the, 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 the sun. And then, you know, the second problem they have is the pig industry. Um, anybody from Denmark here? Okay, you have to forgive me if I, I, I say something wrong about your culture. Denmark has always projected itself as a white knight in shining armor for climate change. They are doing everything possible, I think, to hide the fact, to ignore the fact that their pig industry is doing a lot of damage to, to the environment. And that's something that is not addressed at all. Um, so here, our proposition is to really create two superheroes, what we call the dynamic duo. One is the one, you know, just like Batman and Robin. One will be floating in the air, that will be the android swan. And then the swine squad, as in the suicide squad. Um, um, they will be the pigs. So here, there will be this infrastructure that is sent across from mainland Denmark, across to Greenland, to create this new shelter, to reflect the sunlight back into the atmosphere. And this infrastructure will sustain itself in the air using the methane gas from the pig industry. So the pig industry is actually doing something good rather than you know, doing something bad. And these are some of the images of that. One of the other problems is that Denmark, you know, always talks about equality and democracy and being, you know, happy and, and I think Denmark is voted the most happy country in the world. Um, Denmark has 6 million human inhabitants and 29 million pigs. Uh, that's fine, you know, that's not a problem. But the thing is that, you know, if we want to talk about democracy, I think we should also respect the pigs there in Denmark. So what we propose that since the pigs are contributing to climate change or saving Greenland, they should actually have equal rights. So here, the idea that since the pig is contributing, the urban condition would be augmented. Houses, apartment blocks, they should all be augmented to give the pigs equal rights here. And here, this is when they achieve equal rights. They're marching through the city. Another project set in Denmark, this one specifically in Copenhagen. Copenhagen is one of the cities that is experiencing high level sea level rise. And they are really concerned that the islands would be, the, the, the land would even be, it would shrink even more. And what you end up having um, in Copenhagen and many bits of Denmark will be these tiny archipelagos. And here, we were, we were speculating, oops, sorry, a what-if project. What if Copenhagen can achieve immortality through quick freezing of, it in, of its infrastructure in anticipation of future resurrection? Just like what Robert Attinger did with cryogenics. He's frozen himself, you know, with his two wives, with his three cats, two dogs, five neighbors in his basement. You know, and he's hoping that one day he will be thawed and then resurrected. That's what his son believed, David believed that. We're obviously sad, but we're able to freeze Robert under optimum conditions, so he got another chance. So the things that, you know, if we, we take this position of what if we were to freeze, you know, the heritage and culture of what the Huga that the Danish community believes in, could all that heritage and culture and huga be resurrected when the sea level were to drop and decrease? So what we've created is to, as the sea level rises, we will bucket these things up and create a series of spires, almost like ice lollies. So they, they would actually, and within these ice lollies, you would actually freeze in 
all the kind of cultural elements and the things that you, the Danish society will find important. And they would actually become the new spire of the city. And then when time comes, you know, they could be thawed and be re reconstituted. To provide, I, I love the audacity of the Roman engineers. They provided water and physical communication through roads. This is the aqueduct. And the, the Romans have always boasted they are much better engineers than the Greek engineers themselves. Uh, for they have actually, because of these infrastructure, they have conquered much of the Western world. Some of them are less bombastic, like the, the aqueduct, they are quite bullish. This one here, the wells in Venice, there are about a network of 600 of them, were wonderful infrastructure to provide water on the island. I like what Saskia Sassen said. She said about infrastructure. From sewage to electricity and broadband, they should be covered with transparent walls and floors. If you're waiting for the bus, you can actually see how the city all works and begin to engage. And I think that's really, really clever. So whereas we tend to hide them, like, you know, could you imagine if we have a, a transparent floor to London, we can see how the whole London underground system would work. The provision of transport is always a sore point for discussion of any planner, environmentalist, and, and anybody who is have interested in green environments. You know, but yet we are absolutely reliant on it. You know. And I'd like to think that you know, there are better examples to come. Uh, but my favorite one is the image on the left-hand side, the sampan in the fifth element, where the sampan were to dock against Bruce Willis's window blurring the boundary between public space and private space. The image on the right-hand side, on the other hand, is not a piece of science fiction, it's real. Can somebody tell me where it is? Yeah, who say Germany? Okay, where in Germany? It's in Wuppertal in Germany, and it's not a science fiction, piece of science fiction, it's... Um, I love this piece of infrastructure it actually does not confine itself to your sort of planning grid in any shape or form. It actually has life as its own and it animates the whole city. Other infrastructures that actually provide sort of connection would be these two marvelous inhabitable bridges in, in Italy, one in Florence and one in Venice. Um, I would say that they were the precursors to the elevated walkway system that you have in the city of Hong Kong where uh, the roads in Hong Kong were left to vehicles and the elevated walkways would become the new ground for human activities. But I, I, I don't think you know, it's as simple as that, that you know, infrastructure takes you from embankment A to B. I would like to think that you know, there could be other poetic activities happening, like this one, the bridge over across the Bosporus, uh, where you do fish from day to night. Could somebody tell me what this image is from? Fantastic. Okay, you, you make me feel slightly younger tonight, so you know it too. It's from the album cover of Pink Floyd. But I love this image because of the, the flying pig next to it. Um, yeah, but this is what I call the utilitarian castle. Um, and in the film, Children of Men, the power station was portraying, had the role of the Ministry of Arts. And I love the kind of imagination they place within the film, what they could do with the power station rather than what is happening in reality, which is very, very sad. There are other sort of utilitarian castle, like this one here, um, next to Oval Crooked Ground, the gasometer, or Across the skyline of Manhattan, these water tanks. In the underground system, of back to Istanbul, the system. It's one of the most beautiful, beautiful uh, underground structures I've ever seen. Um, and 
for those who have not been there, and if you're going there, when you go there, you really have to savor it with your eyes, not with your ears, because they try to make it touristic. They, they keep playing this loop of very cheesy Pavarotti music. So and, and just ignore it and just savor it with your eyes. It's absolutely fantastic. But I guess the real queen of all, or king of all underground infrastructure, utilitarian castle would be this one, the Stepwells in India. It's absolutely fantastic. Just imagine Buckingham Palace inverted and cast into the ground itself. And this is where, and the negative space would be where you, the monsoon rain will be captured and used throughout the, the year. Each floor is about five meters tall, um, and you can actually step down into it. It's really an absolutely ingenious piece of work. I think, you know, science fiction writers, are, they are much more prolific. They have greater imagination in imagining how we can source water. In the, in the novel Dune, Frank Herbert wrote about many devices that you could harvest atmospheric water and how you can actually even recycle human sweat and perspiration and urine in what he called the still suit that all of the, the, his characters would wear. And then the water would be recycled. Um, when they were having drought in Los Angeles a few years back, the city actually did contemplate using a lot, not the still suit, but a lot of the kind of devices suggested in, in, the, in the novel itself. Remember, this is 1965, and, and we are still having problem in many, many countries and places around the world where drought is a major issue. This here, I'm sure most of you are familiar with this image. He's probably one of the greatest living architects in the world. Um, this was when Rem speculated. And I think, you know, for me, that was the peak of his imagination. Delirious New York is one of the most wonderful books of all time, for, for in the 20th century anyway. Um, and I love this image where he, the, 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 the architects from the USSR trying to escape to the free world using a swimming pool. I guess infrastructure mobility started with Noah's Ark. I guess at that point, this is, you know, when we realize the, the, the impact or the, 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 what Noah's art set out to do, we should have realized the impact of the flood. So we shouldn't be so surprised with floods and climate change at all, because even in the Bible, we have the big, big flood. So the next project, 20,000 Fish Above the Sea, was in, in a way inspired by, by the idea of a piece of moving infrastructure. This infrastructure is a first aid kit that would actually sail out in big, big schools of them and um, armadas of them to places which will face sea level rise, like the Maldives, for example. And it would contain fresh water, it would contain medical supplies, it would contain food, but most of all, it will have a lot of seeds to grow your own land. And so when this fish were to disem arrive at the destination in this sort of herds, uh, schools of them, they would actually deconstruct like that image over there here. And they would form the, the framework for the inhabitants to plant their own ground, you know, so that they, you know, they, they don't have to become climate change refugees. And this would be the landscape that will be created. I hope that our fish, or at least the 20,000 fish, would be a very, very, very poor cousin to the walking city, or the instant city by Peter Cook here, where he said that you know, this infrastructure will fly to boring northern city. I didn't say that. He said that, I think. Um, nobody from the north here, I hope. Okay, but, and, and then he would actually then, these components would drop down to bring life to the city. The next project, the city of a thousand lakes. It was not a, a sort of hypothetical project. It was a project, we got a commission uh, from the Nanjing government to look into how we would actually um, plan or regenerate the, the, the lower part of Nanjing. If you look at my palm, Nanjing is divided into the historical part, 
the modern industrial part and the countryside. And we were asked to look at the, the, the lower part, the lowest part of it, the countryside. And when we were given the brief, we were at odds with ourselves because when we visited the site, my first instinct was nature is a very important part of it. And we, we, I was very, you know, my mindset was very much like what Will Morris would think in News in Nowhere, that rather than the brief, which was very much akin to Bellamy's thinking in looking backward, where industry, technology would be king, it would be the only thing. I think I just need to brief you a little bit for those who are not familiar with these two authors, that they hated each other. Uh, Bellamy wrote the book first and said the future is all about technology. And then three years later, William Morris was so incensed and he got so inspired by it, he wrote this other one to counter it. And then seven years after News from Nowhere, um, Bellamy actually retracted some of what he said and wrote a compromise novel called Equality, where nature was brought back into the fold of um, human inhabitation. So back to this site in Nanjing. This is the, the, the lower part of it. As you can see, the grey areas and the black areas are all water. So water was about two-thirds of the surface area of this development that we're going to do. And we were very keen to persuade the government to not build skyscrapers. We want to persuade them the economy and the value is in the nature it has. The water fields that they have there are not for just fish. They're generally for crab farming, and the crab from this area would fetch the highest price in China. And so we, what we did was we inserted tiny bits of architecture here and there, but the rest of the time, we kept drawing. We tried to convince them of the poetics that, and the value that already exists there already. Rather than searching and installing unnecessary things, they should value what they've already got at their doorstep. And how, you know, when you articulate nature in fauna, flora, water, and, and rain and clouds, you know, you could get different sort of pattern uh, and texture and color. <coughs> and, and then, you know, even the flat landscape they have, you know, when the, the passing clouds, for example, you can actually see the shadow of these beautiful clouds that are passing by. So it becomes a canvas for nature to perform. That's what we're telling to sell them. That. Um, it, I guess it was quite brave of us to lose the project, but the things that, you know, we tried to tell them not to build skyscrapers. That's the main part. It also, this place reminded me of Isora in Invisible City, where it was a, definitely the city of a thousand lakes. But what was really strange when I went there was the whole place was a bit, a, a touch of, it has a touch of Logan's run about it, because the inhabitants were either the age of one to about 12, and then everybody from the age of 75 and above, and nobody in between. Apparently, everybody in that region would go out to bigger cities to work as in, in the factories, in construction industry, and so forth. And they only come back to, the, to, to this place when it's harvesting, crab harvesting season, which was most bizarre. And then, you know, but th for those who didn't know Logan's Run, Logan's Run is a city where anybody at, after the age of 30, they have to die. So for example, me, you know, I would have died twice already. Um, you know, Chris only have died once. <laughs> Thank you. I think we were also very keen to, to change their mindset about where you can build. You know, we are so programmed that when we build anything, it has to be on land. You know, you can build on water. You can actually live on water. This, the school in Makoko was one of the wonderful, most poetic examples I've seen in, in, in recent years. And so we were introducing many, many sort of floating structures for them that they can build on. And they could change the, the way that they legislate, you know, land and property and, and, and land value. I think, you know, it's not only me that thinks so, but the things that in science fiction film, this one in Avatar, nature was king, wasn't it? So we followed that thought through in the project in Maribor, uh, where we were asked to look into how, what we can do with the forest. Again, we said, we're not going to do anything. What we're going to do is to just to put certain sort of little fireplaces for hunters in, in the forest itself. 
and we see the forest that surrounds the city as the, the inhabitable supermarket where you can get you know, everything fresh, everything local, from fruits to berries to, um, to mushrooms to sustainable hunting season of wild boar and deer. And again, we want to project the beauty of what exists already. Um, so what we inserted were these sort of, uh, sort of fireplaces for hunters to really gather during winter months. Okay, Pleasantville. How many of you have seen Pleasantville, the film? It, one? Um, come on, you must have seen Pleasantville. Reese Witherspoon, she's not that old. So, Pleasantville is a black and white movie in general. So, you know, I'm going to be very generic about it, give you a general description. And when the inhabitants were to break any of the rules, then it would have splurts of color coming through. And this is, this is it. So the, the film, you know, perfection is actually seen through black and white. So here, Pleasantville never rains. The highs and lows rest at 72 degrees. The fire departments exist only to rescue treat cats, and the basketball team never misses the hoop. This is what perfection means in Pleasantville. To be honest, I think perfection is a fruitless endeavor. And this is a problem we have as designers and planners. We plan, we design perfection into it. And we burden ourselves with all that to come to project this thing. I mean, you know, take for example, when you see these sort of buildings or especially domestic architecture in magazine, in glossy magazine, they look absolutely perfect. I mean, I'm sure the inhabitants tidied it up before you, the photographer turned up for it. So the things that, you know, I would like to think that, you know, we could do better by not burdening ourselves uh, to, to want to create these perfect environments. So we were commissioned to look into uh, this site in Australia. Um, anybody from Australia here? Because I probably will be insulting you too. I don't mean it, in, I'm, I'm just kidding. So this is Fisherman's Bend, just outside Melbourne. It's a disused port. And we were asked to look into a master plan to provide all sorts of typologies of housing and house types, flats, apartments, recycling water, recy harvesting solar energy. We gave them the whole works. But what was really, really f funny when we were working on the project, we realized that they have no provision for social housing. It's only for a certain economic group of people. And I've seen many of these sort of types of gated communities in South Asia, in China, in many, many places. And it's very unhealthy. So we, we didn't quite dare to protest outright. We did it sort of in the quiet. You, I will show you the drawings, how we protested. Uh, the inspiration, I guess, came from Alexander McQueen, the designer. I read an article that before he became super famous, he was commissioned to do a winter coat by a gentleman, not a gentleman, a man. Anyway, and what happened was that the man was really unpleasant as a client. So he used his sort of tailoring pencil and wrote asshole in the, in the back of the coat, inside, before he put the lining on. So for years and years, the client was wearing asshole on his back. So the things that, we didn't quite do that with our client, but we did something else. But we felt that, you know, this idea of achieving perfection in this kind of horrible way, it's just like in these two novels here, the, the Adwood one or the Levine one. The Levine one was really, really extreme, where you get the perfect front lawn, the perfect house, the perfect back garden, the perfect wife, the tall blonde woman that never gets old. And in the end, it turned out she's a robot, or they are all robots anyway. So here, we were really not pleased with what we were doing. So what we did was that we actually poked fun in the drawing. So in the living room itself, we have the perfect husband with the perfect housewife counterpart. She, you know, she has to be a housewife. I don't believe in that. I'm just telling you first. We did it as a spoof. We did it as this is the kind of primitive thinking that they were heading towards. And then when you look across, you get the perfect bungalow houses, but they're not on the ground, but they're stacked up into towers. And then here on, 
on your left hand side while wait, they're waiting for the bus or the boats to come by, you know, they would not be standing there being miserable. They will be performing strictly ballroom. Um, and then the highway will be closed off and they, will be, have, they would have this beautiful landscape of seasonal flowers and the children will all be very, very happy. And, and for those who are religious, you know, here, for example, um, it doesn't matter what religion you are, the religious building, for example, here, the church, will come to you rather than you coming to the church. And then, of course, we even created the perfect nosy neighbours who would peer through their binoculars and twitch the, the curtains. And I think the, the, it went to such an extreme, it became almost a driver to, to the project. Here, if you look up onto the ceiling of these stacked bungalows, we even created the perfect electronic blue sky with a perfect candy floss clouds that would pass by. No rain, of course, you can't have rain, um, you know, but it would be, have the perfect sky. I think what I'm saying here is that, you know, in fiction, in reality, you know, these sort of scrutinized choreographed environments like these two here, even in the old world one, they are very, very unpleasant places. You know, they actually not just invade your privacy, but they are discriminating in, in many, many ways. So the last chapter to participate. This is a quote from a congressman called Ray LaHood. He says, go to any major American city, you see roads, bridges, infrastructure that needs to be fixed today. Congress doesn't have the political courage to do what it takes. And they don't really have the vision of America the way that other congresses have had the vision of America. He's absolutely right, I guess. You know, when you have President Eisenhower who championed the interstate highway system, and then Kennedy took America into space, into outer space. And President Hoover built the Hoover Dam. I think President Hoover was a very smart man, not because he commissioned uh, the Hoover Dam to produce electricity and, and blah, blah, blah. As a social infrastructure to engage for all to participate in during the Depression years, that was a smart move. He was very concerned that you know, he didn't know how long the, the Great Depression was going to last. To give state handouts was not solving any problems. So he, he dreamt of this major project that, that wanted to engage for all those who were willing to work to come here, to give them jobs, to give them sort of a place to stay, a place of security and safety for themselves and their family. So they built Boulder City as well next to it. And I think, you know, the Who of them came to symbolize hope for what American industry could achieve. The, the author, J.B. Presley, said, the infrastructure embodied the very image of H.G. Wells science fiction. It's like a beginning of a new world, a world of giant machines and titanic communal enterprises. This is the first glimpse of what chemistry, mathematics and engineering and large-scale organization can accomplish when collective planning unites and inspires them. I think it was a wonderful, inspiring piece of work, not for its engineering as such, but as a social tool. Talking about a social tool, a social landscape here, this is in Holland. And the polders are wonderful pieces of landscape, man-made. And they always say, God made the world, but the Dutch made Netherlands. And I think they have a point there. This is not so much God made these floating um, platforms and communities in, in Peru on Lake Titicaca. Nature gave them that. This here, um, this wonderful lady, Salome, uh, this is a photograph taken by me. I was on the island, I visited the place. This reed here is called Totora reed, and it actually, you know, lives very happily in the freshwater lake. And it provides the material and resource to make everything in your, that you can see here. From the boat here, behind him, the houses, and the platform, the floating islands. The floating islands do not have concrete, steel, or timber structure inside it. It basically is just layered, uh, layers and layers of this material, uh, this reed. And it's fantastic. And when... And I, I guess, you know, we teach sustainability, we teach, 
recycling of material. We teach all sorts of things in architecture school in the Western world. But I have to say, that is the most sustainable community I've ever come across in real life, in text, in pictures, or in anything else. They even have, you know, okay, it did this thing here, the solar panel didn't come from the reed, but, you know, they actually could power their TV and microwave there. So it was pretty amazing. And what was really fantastic was that you, you, the infrastructure was not concrete, steel, or wood. It's something really kind of much more tactile, much more organic, because they have to be replaced very, very often, because the bottom of it, you imagine, soaked in water, it will rot. And it has a cycle to it. It has, you know, so seasons play a large part in this infrastructure that they live on. I have to say, I've been very fortunate. I've been to at least 80% of places that, you know, you ought to see. So my bucket list is sort of pretty good in that sense. You know, and a lot of places and infrastructure, you, when you go there, you know, after you read about it or seen the picture, it's not that, wow, this place did not disappoint me. I was really emotionally attached to it. It was just the most clever, fantastic piece of natural infrastructure I've ever seen. I mean, you know, for example, when I went to Los Angeles for the first time, I wanted to see Sunset Boulevard, right? And, and I, want, I thought I was going to see Julia Roberts there, but all I saw was hookers and drug pushers. When I went to Paris to see, I'm going to offend the French now, when I went to Paris, I, I thought that this Eiffel Tower of yours is going to be enormous. But so for some reason, when I saw it, it's much smaller scale. Even the Great Wall of China looks much smaller when I was there. I mean, it's not a criticism. It's just that, you know, sometimes when you read so much about some, some things, you have a different projection of it. But this place was amazing. Talking about something very, very real to something very, very artificial. I call this a heterotopia city. This is, Los and, this is Las Vegas, and you could get every, everything there. I love the cheesiness of it. I love everything that, you know, the highbrow would, would actually scorn. It. Uh, I love everything that is um, American about it. Um, there's another heterotopia for general participation, which is Palm Dubai. Um, th this one, when they build it, they chuck so much sand and concrete into the water that it destroyed mo most of its corals and ecology around there. You have to say, I mean, you know, we cannot blame the Americans and the Middle Eastern for everything. I mean, even the Romans did terrible things when they built the Colosseum. Because the things that, you know, not only did they throw slaves to the lions, but they also flooded this place. You know, it was used for maritime uh, uh, rehearsals and performances. So it was the, the center of the Colosseum was flooded. I think, you know, arenas and coliseums are incredible infrastructure to cajole everybody to come together, to cheer or to jeer. Here, this is an, a great example in fiction. Could somebody tell me where this comes from? Thank you. And this one? That's very good, from Thunderdome. What I love about this one, not the, this is the, the, not the Charlie Theron version, yeah? This is the <coughs> Tina Turner version. Is that the, the arena is not like that. It's inverted. The engagement of the audience is that they have to cling on to the outside structure, to peer into it. I think, you know, I, I, I just love the, 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 this whole environment that, of the spectator and the performer. And similarly, Heterotopia also exists in, in our, at our doorstep. This is down at the mall during the London Olympics, uh, where they constructed, they wanted to construct sort of Copacabana Beach, I guess, on the mall for the volleyball, uh, the, the beach volleyball games. I've been to Rio and having the beach on the mall is not quite the same because the queen doesn't look so hot in bikini. Uh, I think sometimes, you know, we also remember infrastructure, how it was used once upon a time. And memories are very powerful tools, as we all know. Here, the picture on the right-hand side, you know, this is probably a railway station, a tube station not so far from you, that during the Blitz, it was used to shelter many, many uh, in Londoners. And this picture in Normandy, where these war bunkers happened, I was there to take this photograph, and this man actually said that he was, he sat there for a long time, it was very tragic, because this infrastructure were the things that he engaged in. He was part of the, the battle at that ground. 
Finally, I'm going to show you the, uh, the, this, and there's one more case study, but I'll show you the final, sort of my final and favorite image of infrastructure. This piece of infrastructure only lasts for five to eight days. It changes color from white to pink sometimes. It actually cajoles everybody, the rich to the poor, the old to the young, the suited men to the uniformed school children, all to come together to picnic underneath it. And this beautiful infrastructure is under threat because in many places in Japan, because of the heat island effects, you know, spring would, winter would jump, would skip spring and it would jump straight into um, summer. And the, the window for the, these wonderful uh, blossoms to happen becomes shorter and shorter and shorter. And I think, you know, I, I would think that, you know, if Donald Trump doesn't believe in climate change, he should make observations of the, the blossoming season. And they are being truncated and becoming shorter and shorter. I think this video that you're taking needs to be edited. I think I probably will be sued by many people from Woody Allen to Ram Kohas to Donald Trump. So it needs to be edited. <laughs> My last case study here called Corporate Republic, The Search for Utopia. A map of the world that does not include utopia is not worth even glancing at, for it leaves out the one country which humanity always land. And when humanity lands, there's, it looks out and seeing a better country sets sail. Progress is the realization of utopias. This last case study is set on the equator itself. Um, the equator is the ideal site to exploit the drastic changes in priorities and daily habits of global citizens and to attract private investments and restructure business models that adapt to new demands and participation. This is a project that we would use the rubbish that you and I, yes, you and I, dump into the ocean, in the Atlantic Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. There are heaps of these rubbish sitting out there now. And we're going to use them to, to make physical the equator. And this will be a land that will be free for all to engage. You know, there's no sort of... The citizenship is open to everybody. And it will be open to climate change refugees as well as war refugees. And this is also where we would experiment with you know, the idea that capitalism might not be so bad after all. So it will be the opposite of this utopian environment in the film Brazil. Brazil, the film, not the country. And in Brazil, it was a very dystopic uh, place. In our condition, we would like to see this as a very utopic condition. The main resource there would be cactus. Cactus is the one plant that would grow very, very well in very extreme uh, heat, sunlight. And the water from the cactus will be bottled because it's the purest water you can get on the entire planet. And then the pulp itself will be made into suntan lotion because the sun is getting aggressive, we need suntan lotion. One of the reasons why water is going to be very, very expensive is because we have contaminated our rivers, reservoirs, lakes, rivers, and you name it. Uh, through agriculture or industry. And so companies like McDonald's will no longer sell you hamburgers. They will actually participate in this thing by selling you bottled cactus water or suntan lotion. Everybody will, be, will have a job if they want to work. And this is the corporate republic, the employment bureau. It would actually turn up, it would sail along the equator next to this land uh, where cactus is planted, and as it sails along, it's always 9 o'clock and 5 o'clock. So people will be working constantly. So hard work will pay off. This city here was inspired by, you know, many, corp many company towns, corporate cities that, you know, we all know. From Bourneville in this country to Boulder City that was built to accommodate all the workers of the Hoover Dam to, for example, Wolfsburg, uh, in Germany. These are company towns, yeah, that everybody in that city or town relies on one industry only. And here, um, it, it's based on that similar model. So we are to explore if in industrialization or capitalism is that bad. It's a question uh, because, you know, we are so politically correct these days. Um, you know, 
capitalism is always seen as bad. So we are trying to explore if capitalism and this idea of occupying uh, the equator would allow us to break all boundaries of nationality and territory. My last image here, I think, I, you know, I hope I'm in my sort of drugged out state from Boots, not from anywhere else. Um, I've entertained you enough to leave you to think that I'm a storyteller tonight, not an architect, because I think it's not really helpful at most times that we think, my God, I'm going to be an architect, I'm an architect, I need to resolve architectural planning issues and I need to give a solution rather than, you know, you spend time speculating because as I said, you know, sometimes, you know, when you're an alchemist, most, you know, you can come up with the right answers to address some of the issues and you can actually address it, you know, in, in an indirect way rather than, you know, have a really aggressive attack on a problem. So I like to finish with this quote. The purpose of a storyteller is not to tell you how to think, but to give you questions to think upon. So thank you all very, very much. Any questions? Okay. I'm sure I'm not as entertaining as a drama that you have here in the school now. It's been pretty chaotic, actually. So, so yeah. okay, please. I had a question that's maybe not related to the book directly, but more in terms of your practice versus the... Please stand up, please stand up. Ah, okay. <clears throat> so it's more to do with the practice and your academic work. But like, do you find the aesthetics of your work kind of limiting when you're doing competitions or trying to convey an idea to people who are more pragmatic, let's say, that the aesthetics limit the design potential? I think we have two departments, should we say. Okay. There's one that we do the haute couture, mm -hmm. which is some of the works that you've seen tonight. Right. I mean, he says it with great arrogance. Um, and then the other part, we would do the, the high street, where you give them five ideas in stage one, and then it, you get into stage two, you reduce it to two ideas. Because if you, if you go from five ideas to 10 ideas, you definitely lose the competition or you lose the commission, usually. I was advised that by the, 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 one of the, my clients on a big project, he said, the problem with you and your office is that you keep bringing too many ideas to us. It's very expensive, your ideas. Every idea costs us money. So the things that, you know, no, but in all seriousness, I think, you know, the projects, the research projects we do are very much part of the exercise that would feed the other projects that we have. We were brave enough to tell, the, the, for example, the project in Nanjing, that building skyscraper was a bad idea. You know, they should really value what they have at their doorstep, and we should only do very tiny interventions into the landscape. And I think, you know, we've come to a point that we, we just say, this is what we believe in. And I think, you know, we should really be, be like that. We should really believe in what we do as architects, as designers, because in the, in the 21st century, I think a lot of practices, a lot of architects, myself included at one point, you know, we have become these sort of helpless creatures that are dominated by what the client wants, what they want to tell you to do. And in a way, you know, the same with, not just in practice, but the same with schools too, in a way. Because, you know, students join certain units, for example, because they know that they can get a job afterwards. You know, and because the, the office, they, they want to go to demand that kind of expertise or that knowledge. And I think this is not the way to do it. We should really believe in what we do. And that's what I think we do, at least what I do in my research and my practice now. We do believe in what we do. You can either take it or you can lump it. Uh, I mean, I can say that. Maybe you can't say that as a student. Are you a student here? I am a student. Okay. So you can't say that. But the things that, you know, I think it's very, very important that we need to empower ourselves intellectually, creatively to make advancement in the built environment culture. Because otherwise, we keep doing the same thing. I mean, you'll find out that, you know, when you have an office or even work for practice, the clients tell you what they want, 
And because they've seen something that they have, that they have then they say, oh, why don't you do it exactly like that? If we keep doing that vicious, it will be a vicious circle. We will never advance. I mean, we might as well go and live in caves. So, you know, I think, so in terms of the drawings, I think a lot of times we try to communicate in certain ways. I think the set of drawings here were inspired by the, like comic books. We wanted to draw like comic books. We, I didn't want to draw, we want to draw the kind of narratives of the project rather than the, 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 the traditional orthodox plans and sections and so forth. We want to draw the spatial stories that, you know, the urban interaction within the, 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 the city itself. Right. And those were important. Yeah? Yeah, on the flip side, would people be like, oh, this is exactly what I want, and then you're like, uh-oh, stuck that's, in a narrative. Then. That's great. <laughs> that's, that's absolutely fine. But the things that, you know, I think, you know, I think we also need to challenge communication tools right. as well. You know, I, I, I don't believe in you click a button and then it renders itself. Um, or worse still, you, you stick it in the, a 3D printer, it comes out, all the models turn out white, and it's, you know, that's not, not good for me anyway. Perfect, thank, and, you. thank you very much. Any other question? Yep. Uh, whose responsibility would you say it is to kind of implement changes like this? It's your responsibility. Not me, because I'm too old yeah. now, because in Logan's run I would die twice already. So you're still young. You haven't got the first stage of dying yet. No, seriously. I think all of us need to engage in it. You know, student, are you a student here? No, a uh, goldsmith. Okay. Yeah. Uh, all of us, from designers to non-designers, one of the reasons why we did the drawings we did was that we want, I, I also want, you know, it sounds really grand, but I want what I'm trying to say to go beyond architectural and planning circles. I wanted to really engage with sort of somebody like my mother who doesn't know anything about front door or back door. You know, she can look at the picture and say, oh, that's intriguing. You know, and I want people to engage in the whole culture and politics of the built environment. That's really important. That's why we drew certain drawings the way we did. And I think, you know, all of us should be involved in the co-discussion of sustainability and climate change. I hate the word sustainability and climate change because it's so generic. You know, I, I still don't know what the definition of sustainability is because I think there are a million definitions of it. But, you know, it, it, it would only make progress if we believe that we can all contribute in it. So the things that now we talk about recycling materials and things like that. When I was a student in this building, we never, the word sustainability never occur. Recycling, it doesn't happen. And now we are edging a little bit towards that. And I think, you know, maybe when you come to get to my age, you know, maybe there will be more advancement in that area. But we need to empower ourselves as just normal citizens who are not even architects to actually lobby our politicians to really say, come on, we have to do something about it. It doesn't matter if climate change is true or not, but we need to really protect Mother Nature. We need to do something that doesn't keep destroying and damaging and poisoning our Earth. I mean, I seriously believe in it. I mean, for example, you know, anybody out there could actually do something like, we should boycott Tesco from importing raspberry from some outer space country, you know, to our cities in the UK in January. I think it's disgusting to eat raspberry and strawberry in January. We are not eating seasonally and the carbon footprint is enormous. And that should not happen. I mean, simple things like that. And, and, and the things that, you know, if we collectively are interested in that subject, I'm sure we could actually make advancement in it. I'm not saying, that, you know, CJ doesn't have the solution tonight. You don't have the solution yourself, but collectively we can do something. And I think places like Goldsmith and the AA and the Bartlett and schools, you know, not just schools of architecture, but generally educational institutions can actually engage the younger generation, even sort of, you know, primary schools, you can engage with them. So I think that's really, really important. I don't know, do you agree with me? No, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not, that's not really strange, yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? No? Okay. No, CJ. Thank you very, very much, CJ. Thank you all very much. Thank yeah. you all very much. Thank you.